I'd like to talk to you guys today about a topic that as we uh, get into this message about unity, that sometimes we, we start thinking, how, how, what is my role? What is my job in, in helping our church stay, stay together and stay focused? Isn't, isn't that the job of the, of the pastor or the deacons or the Sunday school teachers or, or, or the leaders in whatever capacity it might be? And when we think about the importance of the church in being unified as the body of Christ, friends, that's, that's a huge piece of all of our responsibilities of helping the body of Christ stick together and go forth as one. And, and when we think about this, I, I, I want you to understand that we are talking about the unity of a church. We're talking about something that is, that is fragile. It breaks all too easily. And when it's broken and when it's messed up, man, it is hard, hard to get a church going in the right direction again. If you've ever been through a church that's gone through conflict and separation, you know what I'm talking about. You know the pain of that and you know the hurt and the heartache of how to get through that and navigate through those details. This August, I'm going to go preach a revival for a very, very good friend of mine. His name, I'm not going to tell you his name right now. Anyway, he, uh, he's, he's 70 plus years old. He's been a pastor forever and ever. And after he'd been at this church for 39 years, a long, healthy, good ministry, a growing church, the leadership decided that he was too old to lead that church any further. His plans were to retire after 40 years, but they decided you needed to go at age 30, after 39 years. And my friend told me, he said, at that point, I decided I, I could do a couple of different things. One, I could rally my troops and I could fight and I could have stayed in that congregation for another year. But I realized if I'd have done that, the church would have lost. He said, the second thing I could have done is I, I could have fought them and I could have lost and they, my, my opponents would have won. But in the end, the church would have lost. So the church loses again. And he said, so I, I realized that the best thing for me to do and the best thing for the church to do was for me to just to graciously step out and resign and retire and, and just go off. And, and that's what he did. Now, I, I've been a pastor for a long time, and, I, and I've seen a lot of church conflicts that did not end quite like this. My friend left that church, and he, he found a, a beautiful little church where he's been serving for the last seven years. He's almost 85 years old at this point, doing a beautiful job. And the church that he left called a pastor, and they, they had a, a relatively seamless transition, and they're doing a really, really good job. It was a win-win for the kingdom. It could have been ugly, 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 but it, it wasn't. Another good friend of mine pastors a church, and he uh, had a person make some comments about on Facebook, social media, about some things going on in the church. And those Facebook comments created such a firestorm that his church, which was running about 250, lost over 100 members. When we talk about unity, we're not talking about ideas and thoughts and plans that don't really affect us. Unity is something that all of us are engaged and have an opportunity to plug and, and make a difference for the kingdom of heaven as we seek to do this in a significant manner. Think about it. Historically, how has the church handled conflict? How have we handled uh, a diverse opinion or different ideas or different thoughts? We, we have not handled it well at all. In fact, in our Baptist journey for the last 20 years, we've had some pretty strong conflicts. And one of the things that we've seen is we have seen people who, instead of growing closer to God, they, they've done this. They don't want to hear what the church has to say because we keep arguing and fighting and fussing among ourselves. And, and when we see the church doing silly things and fighting over issues and different matters, it, it creates a sense that, that people just aren't as interested in hearing what, what a person has to say. And so the body of Christ, as we've tried to deal with conflict and we've tried to focus on unity, some of the things that we've done, it just hasn't worked out as, as well as we, as we would have liked and maybe we'd have, we'd have thought. Now, I've I, I got to let you know something pretty clear pretty quick. I am not a Methodist for a reason. And I'm not a Catholic for a reason. And I'm not a Pentecostal for other reasons. I'm not a Presbyterian for other reasons. But those different groups are not my adversaries. They are not my, my enemies. They are not even in in competition with us. They are brothers and sisters in Christ that we are working together with to advance the Redeemer's kingdom. We might disagree about baptism. We might disagree about communion. We might disagree about leadership. We might disagree about the role of women in the church. But in the, in the bottom line, we are followers of Christ seeking to go forward. Now, I need you guys to help me with something real quick. I'm going to count to three. And when I hit three, I need you to say out loud the denomination that you grew up with. 
Whatever denomination you grew up with, I want you to say it out loud for me. Can you do that? One, two, three. Oh, okay, you, you don't need to shout, but anyway, <laughs> let's try that again. Don't shout it out. One, two, three. Okay, obviously you can hear Baptist, but you hear a smattering of other things. Now let, let's try something else. I need you, when I count to three, to shout out, now this time shout it out, shout out the name of the church that you grew up in, the name of the church. One, two, three. All right. Could you hear anybody? I, I couldn't even hear. I couldn't hear a predominant Manassas Baptist church. Now, I need you to do one other thing for me. When I count to three, I want you to shout out the name of the country that you were born in. The name of the country that you were born in. Can you help me out with that? One, two, three. There you go. You can, it's again, it's a rumble there. Now, I need you to help me with this. On three, who died for your sins? One, two, there you go. On three, who rose from the grave? One, two, three. Jesus. On three, who do we serve? One, two, three. Jesus. Don't you think it's a little bit more important how we focus on Jesus? Jesus is the focus that we have, and Jesus is the reason that we're, we're called to do the things that we're called to do and asked to do. When we look at the story of the Gospel of John, when John is, is Jesus is telling the disciples what's important for us as followers, he says something very significant that we've got to hold on to. He says in verse 14, he says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The Roman world that the disciples were trying to impact and make a difference, it was a harsh, ugly, unpleasant, unfriendly place. It was divided by language, by culture. It was divided by different kinds of social status. It was divided by those who had money and those who had nothing. The Roman world was held together by a sword. And Jesus comes along with a group of followers, and he tells people who are going to follow him, he says, you're going to make a difference in this world by how you care for one another, by how you love one another, by how you serve one another, how you show compassion for one another. Another. Jesus says to this community of faith that starts springing up that you're going to be identified by the way in which you love one another and the way you love your neighbor and you care for the neighbors around you. When we think about unity and the importance of unity for a church in standing together in being the body of Christ that meets together, we think about this issue is why is unity so vital for the church? You don't have to look far in history and see where the church has messed this up. You understand that nation states have been formed because of church conflict. You understand that there are generational, there's generational violence because church folks have disagreed on issues. You can go to Serbia, you can go to Ira I Ireland or other countries and see this issue. Friends, we're not gonna change history. We can't even really change perception. But what we can deal with is what happens within our community of faith, within our body, within the people who gather here and worship the Lamb here and come together under the cross here. We can create something that's beautiful. We can create something that's life-giving. We can create something that gives hope. We can create something that gives support to one another in this community of faith. Friends, holding together, standing together as a unified body of Christ is something that this community, that this world desperately, desperately needs to see. And you and I can play a part in that. Think about this. In Ephesians chapter 1, the scripture says this. For this reason, ever since I first heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Friends, when we look at this text, that kind of tells me two pretty significant things. One is that you and I have a vertical relationship with the Father. The scripture says, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord, okay, there's a vertical relationship. And then it says also the love you have for all the saints. This horizontal affinity for one another. That, that you have this love for God that you gather together to worship and you gather together to pray and you gather together to serve and to give and do all that good stuff. But there's this other piece that you have love for one another and that is made manifest in so many different ways as you seek to advance the Redeemer's kingdom by loving your neighbor and caring for your neighbor and supporting your neighbor in a variety of different ways. The scripture says in Romans chapter 12, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Friends, 
you realize that we're not agree, going to agree on everything, right? We're going to disagree about stuff. We're going to disagree about people. We're going to disagree about politics. We're going to disagree about all kinds of different things. And the scripture says very clearly, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Just because you have an opinion doesn't mean it's the right opinion. Just because you have an idea doesn't mean it's exactly the right idea. It's a good idea and it's a good opinion. And when we talk to people, one of the pieces of this puzzle is, look at this next verse, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. Be careful. Be, con be considered as you talk. Consider that you might not have all the pieces of the story before you go and, and say some things. The Bible says in Romans 14, so let's use all our energy in getting along with each other. Help others with encouraging words and don't drag them down by finding fault. Guys, this, this is kind of significant stuff. When we talk about unity and we talk about doing the things that God's asked us to do to stand as the body of Christ, this unity is huge. So what can you do? What can I do to make the body of Christ that meets in this place? What can we do to stand together to advance the Redeemer's kingdom, to be an outpost of the, of the heavenly host where we can be the body of Christ that makes a difference, not only in Manassas, but in other parts of this world? What can we do as the people of God who meet here? Three things we're going to talk about pretty quick, and I want to go from here. And the first thing is, one of the ways you can build unity is by being an encourager, by being a person who shares an encouraging word, who shares a word of hope, who shares a word of support when friends are going through a difficult spot. My wife is a teacher. She's taught for 20 plus years, and she says this. Anytime a student gets in trouble at school, gets in, gets, gets in trouble for saying whatever they say or gets in trouble for not doing some homework or whatever it might be, and that kid gets fussed at by the teacher or other persons in the classroom, that child needs eight encouraging words to get built back up to the place where they need to be. In your life, in your work, in your home, in your neighborhood, wherever you're going and whatever you're doing, when you get some bad news and somebody says something in a negative way, one of the things that you need is somebody to give you a word of encouragement. I hope you find that at home. I hope you find that in a friendship. I hope you find that in a variety of different ways. The scripture says it like this in Philippians chapter 2. Do everything readily and cheerfully, no bickering, no second guessing allowed. Go out into the world uncorrupted, a breath of fresh air in this squalid and polluted society. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and the living God. Carry the light-giving message into the night. I have a neighbor that lives next door to us, and I, I've not been able to speak with her because she's, uh, she's hearing impaired. And in the course of living next to her for the last eight months, I've waved at her. I've tried to say hello to her. But our language issue, and I can't communicate with sign language, I just haven't been able to, to say anything to her. I thought she was from the Middle East, and so I didn't know if she spoke English very well. This week we met at the mailbox, and I said, well, I'm going to find out her name, and I'm going to talk to her for just a minute. And I found out she wasn't from the Middle East. She's from Cuba. And when she found out that I'd been to Cuba on two different occasions, it just changed her whole perspective. Her face lit up and we started talking. And when she found out that I could speak Spanish, she started speaking Spanish. And I, I was having to read her lips and that was very, very hard. So I had to say, slow down, please. But this lovely lady from Cuba who was able to meet a neighbor that could talk with her in Spanish that had been to her homeland. Friends, you want to talk about an encouraging word that took place in her life for just a minute? What about you? When you encounter a neighbor or somebody at work or whoever you're engaging in different places, do you think you might have an encouraging word for them? This week I had a family send me a message about some challenges going on in their home. And they're dealing with some uh, very ugly, ugly custody issues. Very difficult. And we talked on the phone. We prayed on the phone. They cried on the phone. And it was, it was not pleasant. And they told me about a Sunday school class in this church that has been wrapping their arms around them and walking with them and giving them the encouragement that they need and helping them navigate some very difficult, very difficult places. And I thought to myself, yes, that's what the body of Christ is called to do. When we're walking through a storm that we're not by ourselves, that there are people who are readily and cheerfully speaking to us, that they're a breath of fresh air, that they are giving us a glimpse of good living. Friends, that's, that's powerful stuff. Powerful, powerful stuff. So one of the ways that we build unity in our church is that you and I practice encouragement 
with the people that we sit next to, the people that come into our church, the people that we meet and go out and have lunch with in all those different capacities. A second way, we build unity in our church by practicing forgiveness. Guys, I don't know if this is going to be a, a, a shocking statement to you, but you and I are going to make mistakes. We're going to say the wrong thing. We're going to do the wrong thing. Something is going to happen where we're going to insult somebody or something negative is going to take place. And we have a challenge and we have a choice at that moment that we can hold on to a grudge and we can deal with the enmity and we can deal with the anger. Or we can deal with whatever it might be or we can start practicing forgiveness. How many of you have ever had an email from a person that was just not pleasant or just not nice? Or maybe you received a, a voicemail and somebody left a voice bomb on your phone. And, and when you hear that message, it just sucks the life right out of you and you have an opportunity at that moment when you hear those things take place to get angry to deal with it to, to process it or maybe you can do what Jesus said in Matthew 18 go have a conversation with the person that uh, that did these things and I'm not saying go have a throw down fight but maybe go have a conversation about what's what's taken place there are going to be times and there are going to be events in our church in our life where we don't agree and when we don't agree it doesn't mean that we have to be ugly in fact, the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Clothe yourselves with kindness, with humility, with gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. A couple Wednesday nights ago, I was doing a Bible study. And in the course of our Bible study, I, I pointed out a fellow in our church who's done a prison ministry for 30 years. His name is Wayne Gorsuch. And I was talking about Wayne's ministry and how he'd impacted inmates for 30 plus years. And as I was just talking about Wayne, about this and about that and how he'd served and what he was doing, it was a good dialogue with Wayne and the rest of the congregation. And then towards the end of our Bible study, we were talking about people who live in chains and people who are living in bondage. And a fellow spoke up and he said, Pastor David, I was in bondage for a long time. I said, well, tell me about that, sir. He said, I was in bondage to alcohol and I found myself in Wayne's ministry in prison. And I said, excuse me? He said, I was put in jail for multiple DUIs and Wayne was my mentor. Wayne walked with me. Wayne helped me come to terms with what was going on and Wayne helped me deal with my, my challenges. Friends, that was a kind of a God moment that none of us were expecting when he said that, but it was a powerful place of learning a little bit about forgiveness and choices that we make. The scripture says in verse 12, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. Every one of you, when you got out of bed this morning, got your shower and you're getting ready for church, you're getting ready to do whatever you're going to do, you made a choice about what you're going to put on. You made a choice if you're going to wear a tie, you're going to wear a coat, you're going to dress, you're going to wear shorts, you're going to wear whatever you're going to wear. You made a choice. You pulled the clothes out of the closet and you put them on and you came to church. Some of you look better than others. I'm not going to call names. But anyway, we, we all made a choice to get dressed and do it is, whatever it is that we came dressed with. Do you see what the scripture says? Those of you who are holy and dearly loved, it says clothe yourselves. It says clothe yourselves with compassion to intentionally, consciously put on compassion as you get ready to go out. Put on kindness, put on humility, put on gentleness, put on patience. One of the ways that we build unity and we build strength within the body of Christ is not only that we just practice encouragement, that we practice forgiveness. That we practice forgiveness and we choose to live in such a way that when a person has hurt us and a person has said some things or done some things, that we don't hold that in their face and rub their face in their failure, but that we walk with them just as Wayne walked with this individual and helped them find some hope and find some life. Guys, I, I have been a part of churches and I've heard of churches that when a person gets a divorce that they're out the door. I've heard of churches when they've fallen in other types of sin that there's not a lot of grace and there's not a lot of mercy, that there's a lot of judgment. Friends, one of the pieces of the puzzle of the beauty of Christ and the beauty of the church is not that we shoot the wounded who have fallen, but that we help them up and we help them get back on the track and help them go on the way in which, in which they should. How do we build unity within our church? We encourage one another. We practice forgiveness. And then we do this final piece. We work together. 
Last two weeks ago, we got together for uh, Feed My Starving Children. At least 300 people from this congregation partnered with 10,000 other people within, across northern Virginia. And we came together and we fed almost five, prepared almost 5 million meals. 14,000 children are going to be fed for an entire year because the body of Christ in this region came together and worked in a significant manner. And they took care of hundreds and thousands of children for an entire year. When the body of Christ does this, it does does something significant when our church practices this when we come together and we share things in common when we serve together and we act together and we go forward together when we act as the body of Christ together incredible things take place last week when we gathered together several of our people hundreds of our people came together across services across racial lines across all kinds of stuff and we worked together to do something for the kingdom of heaven. We even had one guy who couldn't put on a hairnet. He's not here today. I can show this. He gave me permission to show this before. He, I knew he was going to be out. The picture is that the body of Christ, when we come together and do what Jesus is asking us to do, we're doing something quite significant. Two weeks ago, our uh, ESOL program came together for a meal. And if you look at that table, you can see families from uh, China, family from Kurdistan, a lady from Mexico. And you can see our congregation blessing this neighborhood as we come together to bless others and work together and serve together. When we talk about our, our upwards basketball program and we see the thousands of people that come through the doors of this church who are blessed because of people who work together with our warming center, with our food closet, with our youth program, our children, whatever it might be, when we come together, we can do some absolutely phenomenal things as the body of Christ that works together. Unity, it's huge. It's huge for the body of Christ. It's huge for a church to stand together. It's huge for a church to stand united as it goes forth in this world. When you think of this church and how we stand together, what is your part? What is your role? What is your involvement in this? I, a couple of weeks ago, I, I sent out an email and I asked about 90 people to tell me what they thought were the greatest, what they thought was the greatest strength of this congregation. 90 people got that email. About 75 have responded in the, night, in the past couple of weeks. Of those 75 that responded, the predominant response was this, relationships, that I can go through life with another person. A second and third response was the idea of faith and discipleship, growing in our faith and growing in understanding of God. Third and fourth was the diversity of the congregation, the, the diversity among all the people. And the final one was worship, that these are our strengths. And I wanted to read you three. This first one comes from Casey. Casey wrote this. With an eight-year-old and a five-year-old, I spend a lot of time in D Street Wing. I see volunteers, leaders, volunteers and leaders week after week on Sunday and Wednesday, giving to and investing in the lives of my little ones. They teach, encourage, love, and influence the lives of those who will one day have the ability to do the same to others. Their passion for the hearts of our children is made evident through their commitment, investment, and most importantly to my eight-year-old, High fives. The engaging environment they provide make it easy to get two kids dressed and out the door because they are always excited to go to church. If you're a mom who has an eight-year-old and a five-year-old and they're excited to come to church, that's a good thing, people. When my family first started attending NBC, my husband and I attended the 930 service. Front and center upon entering was a lady named Miss Claudia. She was always ready with a smile and a handshake, and she paid enough attention to notice when we'd missed a few Sundays and said... I haven't seen you in a spell. The very first Sunday we returned. Now, we, attend, we attend the 11 o'clock service where there's always a line of hello and welcome. Hattie even noticed that I cut my hair and commented how much she liked it. All of these things say, we want you here. You have a place. And without the passion of these people, that message might be missed. I've had the privilege of meeting some amazing women at NBC, women who are a safe place to share, who love me, who encourage me, who grow with me, who challenge me, who, who teach me. We've laughed, we've cried, complained, praised, and we have just been still together. These women, they're my tribe. They show me their passion for Christ. They understand the importance of connecting and staying in the loop with Christian sisters, and they're always ready to give a hug. So if someone somewhere were to, if someone were to ask about the strengths or why did I choose NBC, I'd have to say that I'm in it for the passion 
found in the high fives, in the handshakes, and the hugs. One of our members who attends, who is a part of our church from Africa, they're from the nation of Benin. They wrote something that I thought was quite profound. They shared, they shared this. This is very brief. They wrote, I apologize for my belated response. In my opinion, the strength of Manassas Baptist Church is the acceptance of the race and the culture of diversity. I don't feel that I am a foreigner in Manassas Baptist Church. Now, guys, I want you to, I want you to focus on that for just a second. I don't feel like I'm a foreigner in Manassas Baptist Church. Whether you're from Benin or Iraq or the Ivory Coast or wherever you're from, that person sent a pretty strong message. I want to tell you a quick story that happened with, within the last 10 days. I don't want to give too many details. Our church, has a, uh, our church has a preschool. don't know if you're aware that we have a preschool. And I was meeting with another church to see their preschool. And in the course of talking with the leader of their preschool, we were talking about their students and how many students they have and this, that, and the other. And this leader said something to me that just knocked me out. This person told me, she said, Pastor Donahue, she said, we have X number of students in our preschool, but we could have a lot more if we open the doors to this ethnic group. And I said, excuse me? She said, yes, if we opened our doors to this ethnic group, we would probably have a hundred more, but we can't do that. And I said, why can't you do that? And she said, because then the American parents would pull their kids, so we don't want them to come here. And I heard her say that, and I kind of shook my head, and I moved away, and that was the end of that conversation. That was within 10 days I had that conversation. So when we have a friend in this congregation who says, I don't feel like a foreigner in this church, they don't feel that way everywhere else. They really don't. And when we think about one of the strengths of this church, the beauty of the diversity is huge. It's huge. As Terry said, it's a reflection of heaven. There's this final picture, and I'm going to shut her down. When I see that image of that cross that's on an outpost, that cross on that cliff, that cross that kind of stands alone, we don't stand alone in this place. We stand together. We stand as the body of Christ. We stand as a beacon of hope. We stand as a lighthouse for the community, for the poor, for the hungry, for, for new arrivals, for people who are down and out, for people who've had struggles, for people who are looking for hope, for looking for the direction. And as we look out and as we serve out, the importance that we have is standing together, united as the body of Christ, seeking to advance the Redeemer's kingdom. What's your role in that? Part of it is by encouraging Part of it is by serving. Maybe part of it is dealing with some forgiveness or relationship issues. I don't know. But I know all of us have a role in doing what we can to advance the Redeemer's kingdom in this place, in this hour. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we are grateful for the opportunity that we have to come together as the body of Christ. I'm grateful, Father God, that to be a part of a church, that when new arrivals come, they don't feel like foreigners or strangers in this place, that they feel welcomed and they feel like they're at home. I'm grateful, Father God, that young moms and dads can bring their children to church and their kids are excited to be coming into this church. And Father, I'm grateful for Sunday school teachers, for D6 leaders, for, for people who do all that they can to welcome these children, not just with a, a duty of a class time, but with the joy of learning about Jesus. I'm grateful, Father for Sunday school class that wraps their arms around a, a family going through an enormous crisis right now. Father, I'm grateful for a man who, who for the last 30 years has been going into the jails and serving, serving those who are struggling. And then some 15 years ago, he led a man to Christ who's a, a part of this church and serves in this capacity. Father, help us. Help us to continue to shine the light of Christ as we seek to encourage one another, forgive one another, as we work together to advance your cause, as we seek to be the people that you've asked us to be. This isn't just the preacher's job. This isn't just the, the praise team's job. This isn't just the Sunday school teacher or the elder's job. This is all of our responsibilities 
as we stand together as the body of Christ, pointing people to Jesus, seeking to advance your kingdom in this place. Father, hear our prayer. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.